right. All right. Good morning, Mercy family. Good morning. Woo. All right. Hey, you got your Bible, Ephesians chapter 1. Going over in the New Testament to Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to continue just looking at this letter from the Apostle Paul to this young church that he founded in a city called Ephesus, and that's why it's called the letter to the Ephesians. Um, our passage today, this is awesome, y'all. We're just going to talk about the power of God directed towards us who believe. I'm, I'm excited for it. This is um, a prayer. What we're going to read today is a prayer that Paul prayed for this church. Uh, so what I want to do, uh, like we did last week, I know you just sat down, so uh, give me some grace, but I want you to stand as I read God's word to us here, and then we will. Um, then you can sit down for more than 30 seconds, okay, uh, while I talk about it. So this is Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. Receive this as God's word for us. This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you might know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength. He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one, who fills all things in every way. This is the word of God for the people of God. You can be seated. As we get into this awesome prayer, y'all, it's just it, what I find myself thinking this week uh, as your pastor, like, man, he prayed this for the Ephesian church, but then he, you know, he went somewhere, prays it, but then doesn't just pray it. He writes it down so that they can know what he's praying for them and sends it to them and somehow by them reading it and hearing about it, some measure of the power of God would be unleashed among them just by increasing their awareness to access to said power. And I believe the power of God can be unleashed in this church as we examine and sit under his word today. So I, what I'm saying to you is I am not preaching in vain today. I'm never preaching in vain when we open up God's word and deliver it, but I was thinking about it as Paul gives this letter and gives this prayer to both the Ephesian church and God in his wisdom and kindness, gives it to us, man, just the opportunity for the power of God to be unleashed through the preaching of his word is something I pray for every week, and I get so excited about it as we jump in here today. Uh, Paul's going to major on um, three things but one he's going to elaborate on more than others, so we'll focus on that one thing. Here's the big idea for today. This is like, I try and do this as much as I can. Whenever we're in a passage of Scripture, we're on Sunday morning, you're hearing a sermon, I want you to have one thing you take away. Here it is. The power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead is now directed to you who believe. The Y'all, if you have been in church a little while, be careful that you are not inoculated to what I just said, to what Paul just prayed. The power that brought Jesus out, of, rolled the stone away, brought a dead man back to life, brought Jesus out of the grave, that same power is now at work, directed to you who believe. That's the major emphasis of this prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesian church, so it will be our major emphasis resurrection power here and now. And the reason I want to focus on it is because I know most of you do not describe your Christian life as walking in resurrection power. You don't describe your Christian life as powerful maybe at all. Certainly not resurrection power. Maybe it's because you think like power, you hear that word and you think that's a thing for like Bible times. God parted the Red Sea. God raised Jesus from the dead. He saved Paul from death all these times. That's for back then, but you don't think about 
this afternoon, evening, tomorrow morning, walking in the power of God, that same power. It's not your experience. Maybe you really want to believe in this, but like I said, it's just not your experience. You don't, you don't expect the power of God in your life. You don't think prayer works. And maybe God isn't that powerful because, hey, you've prayed some things. And he hasn't changed the things that you asked him to change the way you asked him to change them. I prayed, they still got sick. I prayed, they still died. I prayed, they still left. If God's power is here and I pray and I ask for it and the bad stuff still happens, what does this mean? Does it mean either he's actually not that powerful or he is, but he doesn't care? Where is God's power? This is why we need this prayer so much. I think we've pressed the mute button a little bit on the power of God in our lives and in our churches when we need to turn up the volume. And in a minute, we'll talk about why you and I don't believe or walk in God's power. But first, what we try and do every time we're in God's word, I want to give you that main point, and then we just walk through the passage because God's word is the best thing for us, okay? So you're around here for a while. You'll see we're in Ephesians. If you're around here the first half of the year, walk through 1 Samuel, then through 2 Samuel, just kind of follow the development. We're doing the same thing with this letter. Just going to walk through it. The letter doesn't take you more than 20 minutes. You can listen to it in 20 minutes if you walk your dog around the neighborhood 1.7 miles, okay, Um, at a decent pace. But we are going to take a lot of time to go through it in our church because it is God's word and we want to devour it and see what he has for us. So we're going to start in verse 15. We'll make it to verse 23. And then I'll explain after having opened that up and hopefully just seen and mined some of the treasures there for us. We'll talk about why we don't walk in this power. All right, verse 15. This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Okay. Two things their pastor, their founding pastor is thankful for. A testimony has come to Paul about the church in Ephesus. The testimony is faith in the Lord Jesus and love for the saints. How do you know faith? How do you know a group of people have faith? Love. That's the fruit. There's something visible about their faith. It's the love for the saints. Um, Francis Schaeffer, years ago, great apologist, philosopher, Christian philosopher, theologian, last century, He said, look, it's really simple. Love is the final apologetic for the gospel. In other words, the best proof that Jesus really was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross as a payment for the sins of sinners like you and me. He rose again. He ascended to the Father. He sent the Holy Spirit to empower the church by living in each one of us day in and day out. And one day he's returning to make all things new. The best proof of all that is Christ-like love among brothers and sisters in the church. That's the evidence that the faith is real. So I'm not going to stay here in this part because there's so much more for us, man, but faith-filled churches are loving churches, serving churches, generous churches. By God's grace, I believe that to be this church. So then my question becomes, is that you? Are you participating in that? Are you just receiving, maybe just watching? Is that true of your life? You say you have faith. Is it evidenced in your love? And it starts in your love for the church. He says, so I never stop giving thanks, verse 16. Never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. Again, this whole thing hits me today as your pastor in this powerful way. Because, you know, I read this and I read it it both as a follower of Jesus, but then as your pastor. And I feel, I feel so thankful that I get to be your pastor. Now, I take my thankfulness for you to God. I don't do it enough. I was convicted about that this week reading this prayer, but my thankfulness leads me to more prayer. And what I do see week in, week out is a church that loves one another. God has started something good in here that I want him to continue. Now to the meat of today, verse 17. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious father, he didn't have to say that. He said, he could just give the relationship to the father. The glorious Father, which you'll see the more that you read this letter and really anything that Paul writes he wants to keep, he keeps trying to describe the indescribable, to keep lifting our hearts and keep trying to press in on the all that we should have at who God is. The glorious Father will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Okay, what does that mean? That he wants God to give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, and he's going to talk more about this. They've already been granted the Holy Spirit. If you're in Christ, God has given you the Holy Spirit who now dwells and lives in you. Okay, 
Again, watch out. You've heard a lot of sermons. Be careful. You've been in church a lot. God dwells in you, Christian. That's remarkable. Don't let that wash over you like it's normal. One of the reasons we don't know the power of God is because we just don't believe actively daily that God is walking with me. God is with me. But that's his promise to us in Christ. So he's not, what do we know? Well, we know that he's not asking God to give what he's already given. He's asking for, instead, the Holy Spirit to give them a fresh outpouring of wisdom and revelation onto them. And the subject of that wisdom and revelation is God, the glorious Father. In other words, Paul is praying, God, would you just reveal yourself more to this church? What a prayer. He's about to specify how he he wants God to reveal himself, but it starts with, God, would you just help them know you more? Would you reveal yourself more to them? Because the best thing for them is to know you more. What if we started praying that prayer for our families? God, I just, would you just help my children know you more? Reveal yourself more to them, to my spouse, my parents, my friends. Start expanding out beyond the nuclear family to the church family. God, would you just help Mercy Church to know you more? It's the best thing for them. He loves to answer that prayer. It's the same prayer. This has been prayed for the church for a long time, and it's there for you and I. He is very interested in answering it. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know. Okay, eyes of your heart, kind of spiritually language. Let's make sure we know what we're talking about here. The heart, especially, and I should say in scripture, the heart is your spiritual center, the core of who you are. So to say the eyes of your heart, Paul's praying for spiritual sight that you can somehow see what God is doing. So what he's praying for is that they might know something, right? So that they may know. But y'all listen, that's not just intellectual knowledge. The devil himself knows these things that Paul is going to pray for. He knows it. So it can't just be knowledge of facts because that would be the same thing as knowing what the devil knows. It's gotta be something else. It's gotta be experiential knowledge knowledge. He wants their souls, the eyes of their hearts to experience no, not just intellectual no. Yes, intellectual no, but the kind of intellectual no that leads to experience no. Uh, For example, lighten the thing up a little bit. My favorite ice cream flavor is mint chocolate chip. Any others? Listen, we suffer together, okay? I know, because everyone else thinks it tastes like toothpaste, and we're like, no, it is what is best, okay? So if that is you, I feel that. In fact, <laughs> I had multiple conversations after the first service with others who have seen the light, okay? And they're like, thank you, somebody who's seen it. But everywhere my family goes, that's what I'm getting. I'll even get that neon green one, you know, that's clearly just food coloring spun up in there. I don't care. I love it. But look, there's a difference between whatever, co- um, not coffee shop, whatever ice cream shop we go into and, you know, they're with the family and we're looking at all the different labels and there's a difference between just reading the label, like there's always mint chocolate chip at every one and they all get, got some silly label like minty choco chippity or whatever, the, you know, whatever they're going to call it, it's mint chocolate chip, right? There's a difference between seeing the label and actually getting it, tasting it, and knowing mint chocolate chip. That's a little bit different, right? In fact, one of the persons came up to me after and said, now, okay, now, which brand is your favorite? Do you like Briars or are you more like Turkey Hill? Because Turkey Hill does it. And I was like, okay, that's a little more than I was ready to go to. But she knew mint chocolate chip, right? I know it's a little bit, a little bit silly, but it's the difference between intellectual knowledge. I can read the label and know that that's that versus experience knowledge. He's praying for experience knowledge. It's kind of knowing where you experience your knowledge of God, where God is not a bunch of facts, but is a person you relate to personally. Now, what does he pray that they know? He prays three things. He's about to walk in. He prays three things that they would know. This is textual evidence. Paul was the first Baptist preacher. He's got three-point sermon right here. Even in his prayers have three points, okay? Um, Now, I'm not, the first two, he only touches on briefly, so I'm only going to touch on briefly, but he he prays that they would experience no, but listen, that they would know him. He does not pray that they would achieve him. He doesn't pray, I hope you achieve these three things. I hope you achieve your calling. I hope you achieve your inheritance. I hope you achieve the power of God. No, they're all theirs. They already have it all. He just wants them to know it. 
to experience what is already theirs in Christ. That's what we're trying to do today. Just wake you up so that you might experience, know that which is yours in Jesus. And you might be missing it. He says, I want you to know what is the hope of his calling. He prays for these believers to know, to see it from their soul and experience hope. And not just any hope. The source of the greatest hope available to humanity, the hope of the calling of God. He has called you by name, in fact. He knows you. He's called you. And you're his in Christ. And if you're in Christ, you're forever his. Are you experientially acquainted with such unshakable hope as that? Do you know that hope? God wants that for you. Some of you are. I see it, man. And your hope strengthens my hope. That's part of the reason the church exists. We can encourage, like put courage into one another by the way we each hope in his calling on us. And I've watched you cling to that hope in storms and you found it to hold when nothing else holds. And now you know, you experience know that hope. The hope of his calling, second thing he prays for, I want you to know what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints. <laughs> Get that? Do you experience the value God places on you? It's remarkable. Because look, the prayer is for you to know, it's not for you to know your inheritance. It's that you would know that you are his inheritance. The treasure at the end of all things for God is the church, his bride, his inheritance. The one treasured possession he has set his eyes on, that's the worth God has placed on you. Man, knowing that worth, it humbles you because you didn't do anything for that. In fact, your life's a hot mess and so is mine. It wasn't you. And yet still, that creates humility and at the same time a sense of confidence and peace as we walk through this world. Because there's nothing someone else can say about me that can take this value away. That's powerful. You are, church, I just believe you're so much more valuable than you realize. Would you walk in that? But then it gets us to the main thing, the kind of emphasis of his prayer, verse 19. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength? Not a little bit of power. Immeasurable, immeasurably great power towards us who believe. God is directing all that immeasurably great power towards us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength. You see what he did? Immeasurable, great, mighty strength. Paul went to the Greek thesaurus and was like, I need every word on power that I can find. And he just dumped them all in here into this thing for us to try and articulate somehow indescribable divine power. And having done his best, to describe it in words, he draws their minds and hearts now to the most impressive and important display of this power in human history. The power that God is directing toward them is the same power God has used before. And so now here's what he's going to do. Now, uh, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23 is almost a little like a side. Hey, I need to tell you a little bit about this power because then Ephesians 2, 1, you know what's going to say? You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But I got great news. That power that raised Jesus, man, is for you too. Oh, it's so good. Verse 20, he exercised this power. Let me tell you about this power, he says. He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. The power of God directed to you who believe is resurrection power. God brought Jesus out of the grave. And I'll pause here in case you're like, I know. That's like one of the basics of Christianity. The point is you may only know it like the devil knows it. You know the facts. But the prayer is not merely for your head knowledge. It's that you might experientially know the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead. Do you have firsthand experience with death to life power? Well, here's the great news. If you're a Christian, you do. Maybe you just need to recall it. We'll talk about that next week. That's Ephesians 2.1. Power that brought up Jesus, that's the only thing, only hope that you have. Because you were dead just like him. And it's not just, <laughs> not just resurrection power. He didn't just raise him from the dead. Look at the second half of the verse. It's exalting power. 
The power brought Jesus out of the grave, was seen by 500 eyewitnesses, and then in front of the disciples, God raised Jesus again from right in front of their eyes. He ascended to the heavens. Where? The right hand of God the Father put back on the heavenly throne that is rightfully his. He's not just the son of a carpenter. He's not just some good teacher. He didn't just come back to life. He is a king, the king, sitting on a throne. And Paul says some stuff to us about that throne. Look at verse 21. Far above, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. His reign is greater than any ruler or authority. That's the seen realm, that first part there, ruler or authority. That's what we can see. But then he's more powerful than any power or dominion. That's the unseen spiritual realm where the devil and his demons work. And just to make sure nothing could possibly be left out, he reigns over every title ever given. And he does it forever. Not only in this age, but the one to come. His reign is all powerful and it is permanent. That, that's the one who's directing his power to you. Look at 22. He subjected, God subjected everything under Jesus' feet and appointed Jesus as head over everything for the church. Not only does he have more power than any other authority, dominion, any other realm, all other things are his subjects. That's what the under the feet is. They report to him. They're subjected to him. His authority is complete. Rulers and powers are within his kingly purview. His power, his authority, they're absolute. Now, this is important. A little bit later in our letter, Paul's going to call Jesus the head of the church. But here he calls Jesus the head of everything. And this universal headship of Christ is for the church. You catch the difference? Christ is head over everything, and somehow that's a benefit for the church. Our head, Christ, is not just our head, but the head of all things. Think about this now. The power specifically given to the church have the power to overcome all things because our head is the one who is head over all things. Out of all the powers in all the realms, the one bestowed specifically on us is the one that also reigns supreme in the universe over all things. Why? So as we go out into the earth representing him, we go with the power greater than all other powers. As you go share the gospel with your friend, neighbor, family member, whoever, however cold you might think they might be towards it, you go with a power greater than whatever power is working against them believing. That's with you. Man, that's, that is power that I wonder if we just either take for granted or just don't even acknowledge or not aware of it. In fact, he says this about the church, verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Where is fullness? That doesn't mean that we fill up Jesus. Jesus is not lacking in any way. It means that Jesus fills up the church. We are the visible fullness of Jesus, the one who fills the universe. We represent Christ here on earth. Think about it. This is the power of God, immeasurably great, resurrecting, exalting, total, eternal, ruling, and filling. That power is directed to me and you. That's ours now. If that is true, I want to spend the rest of the sermon simply addressing the question, why don't we experience that power in our lives? If all of that is true for Christians, why don't we experience it? I think what Paul says in verse 18 should clue us in. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know. There's something that's dulled or dimmed in our spiritual sight. And that's why they didn't know the power of God directed to them. What is it that keeps our spiritual senses dulled to this power? Why don't we experience the hope of our calling, the value of God's inheritance? Why don't we have experiential knowledge of the power of God? Because our souls have been in some measure dimmed to this knowledge and to this power. What is doing that? What is dulling our spiritual sight, dimming our sight, dulling our senses, however you want to say it, to this power? I'll give you three things that I see all the time. I see it in scripture, most importantly. Sin, Satan, and a broken world. Listen, we don't know, I'll tell you the first one. We don't know the power of God because we don't know the power and depth of our sin. Y'all, nothing hardens our hearts towards God like our sin. Most of us, it's gonna come across heavy, it's just what it is. 
most of us are far too comfortable with our sin. We are. It is not that big of a deal. And therefore, God is not that big of a deal. If I don't have a great problem, then I don't have a great need for great power. That right there is the great problem of the church in the West. We're comfortable in our sin. We are so arrogant when it comes to our sinfulness. We are function, I mean, functionally, day in, day out. If we're honest with one another, I'm right here in this. We're functionally more concerned with losing weight, getting good grades, getting a promotion, ensuring the safety of our children, and making fun memories than we are about being rescued from the depths of our own sin. We have an incredible ability to numb ourselves to our own sinfulness. And that's why we do not have experiential knowledge of the power of God. We just don't want it that much. Now, look, that's not everybody, but that's a lot of us. God, who is holy and good and loving and has directed his love at us, we just don't care that much because we don't need it. The all scripture says the wages of sin is death. However much we want to pretend like this is not reality and that we don't need it. True reality is that the wages of sin is death. And death is not just physical, it's spiritual and eternal. We are forever separated from God because of our sin. We are bound for certain eternal death without the power of God working in the gospel. And because death is something most of us don't think about, actually, we do think about it. We think it's far off in the distance somewhere, and we think that we can control it. Because of that, we're not moved by our need to be saved from death. But you talk to Christians who have made a mess of their lives and have come out on the other side walking with the Lord. You talk to those Christians who are aware of their propensity to sin and who have experienced destruction in their lives at their own hands. Talk to a recovering addict, for example. Who's walking with the Lord. Man, you'll see they cherish their salvation. And they exalt the power of God to save because they know it, know it. They have experienced it and are still standing. They know the depth of their sin and their power of their sin nature. So they know the power of God because they're lost without it. They stand in awe that they're alive today because apart from God, they wouldn't be. They'd be lost. Do you have experience, knowledge of that? Do you know your sin? Second one, we don't know the power of our God because honestly, we don't know the power of Satan against us. Now, I know those of you who are not Christians, you're here checking it out. Look, I love that our church is a church where you can come and kind of just check things out, okay? But I know this one in particular, I say, you don't know the power of Satan. And you're like, really? Like, you really believe in like a devil? Sounds like, like the ancient mythology kind of character or whatever. I just have to tell you, maybe not the way you're thinking of it in your head, but yes, we believe Satan is real. And he has power. And if you knew the strength of the power at work against you, you would be desperate for and amazed by the power of God working for you. 1 Peter 5, 7 and 8. Here's your enemy. Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. He is a roaring lion on the hunt, his food is the people of God. He's hunting you. The king of the enemies of God is hunting you. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your faith. He wants you to run away from God. And the only way to overcome him, you are not strong enough to do it. The only way to overcome him is accessing the power of God directed towards you in Christ Jesus. That's why Paul's praying for it. Look at the next, next verse that Peter says after talking about the devil. He says, resist him. How? Firm in the faith. Knowing that the same kind of sufferings, what you're feeling, you feel like you're the only one who's feeling this way, same kind of sufferings, attacks of the enemy are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. You're not going to know the power of God if you don't wake up to the power of the enemy that our God is actively protecting you from with immeasurably great power directed towards you. If you knew the enemy within, if you knew the enemy without, 
and you're sitting here today in church with any measure of victory whatsoever. I'm not talking total victory. We ain't going to experience that until we are face-to-face with Jesus. But if you are here this morning with any measure of victory, like you didn't go on that drinking binge last night. You didn't tear down your husband or wife with those words that you were feeling. You didn't deep dive into porn last night. You didn't give up on God this morning. You actually made it in here. You did serve your spouse. You did read your Bible this week. You did choose holiness when temptation came like a flood against you. You did receive healing. You did step out and share the gospel with that friend. Any measure of victory you experienced, whether it was a step resisting the devil or progressing forward in holiness, if you knew the great powers working against you, you would know, experience know, the immeasurably greater power working for you in those victories. Y'all listen, one of my favorite scenes in scripture, 2 Kings, uh, 2 Kings 6, 2 Kings 6, um, Elisha standing there with his intern, all right? That's not his title, but it's basically who he was, okay? Standing there with his intern, and the inter- they've got an army in front of them, and the intern's like, we're doomed. There's no way. We're doomed, man. They're going to kill us right now. And Elisha's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The number that is for us far exceeds the number that is against us. And then he prays, Lord, open his eyes so that he might see. All, this is the Old Testament version of the prayer Paul is praying right here for you. And he opens, the Lord opens his eyes, and there is a vast army of angels with chariots of fire that are on the hillside that far outnumber the army that's in front of them. And all of a sudden, what seemed so big is actually quite small and trivial and certain to be defeated. And all I'm trying to do today is through God's word get you to look up to the hills and see where your help comes from. It far greater power is available to you than that which is working against you, but the thing working against you is real, and you better wake up to it. Now, here's what's great. If you're in here today and you're like, yeah, I get it, but I, you feel defeated by your sin, oh, that's where the gospel gets beautiful. Here's what's happening. The enemy lurks right there as you lie on the ground defeated, and he wants you to feel shame. Maybe you're listening to this online. You can come to church because you felt so ashamed of your sin. Listen, church, who did Jesus come to save? Sinners. He came to save sinners. To see the very enemy who tempts you to sin then turns around and tells you, you should have known better. You should have done better. How could you? So in shame and guilt, you slink around in the darkness. And Jesus is over saying, no, I've come to seek and save the lost. In fact, the very guy writing this prayer, this is why he writes it, was all these adjectives trying to like, just bursting, it feels like, as he's writing it. See, before this guy, Paul, became a Christian, he was a murderer of Christians. That was his assignment. That was his passion. I don't know what you did last night, but I'm guessing you didn't go around murdering a bunch of Christians. I mean, to then come here to church today was bold, if that's what you did do. I'm guessing not. That was Paul's story, though. And one day, he's going to a town called Damascus to hunt down some more Christians. He's traveling down this road, and he encounters Jesus. And man, I hope this is you today, if you haven't. Now, for him, a bright light shines around so bright that it just drops him right on the ground. And Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Because to persecute his church was to persecute him because the church is his body, that which fills all in all. I'm telling you, if you're united with Christ, you have to be united with the church. It is who you are and what you're made to be. That's a different sermon, but it's very true. He loves his church and identifies so united with his church that he says, why are you persecuting me? And then instead of killing Paul right there, he saves him. Because he had good works planned long before the foundation of the world for Paul. That's what Jesus does. He saves sinners. His power to save you is greater than the sin nature working in you and the devil working against you. It's just greater. So if you're feeling like a defeated sinner, I just want you to hear the Apostle Paul speak the hope of the power of God over you. This is his testimony, 1 Peter 1. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Look, Everything he writes is like that, okay? Everything in Holy Scripture is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. He didn't need to say it, but it's for emphasis to really catch your heart right here. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, 
And I'm the worst of them. But I receive mercy for this reason. So that in me, the worst of them, and maybe, man, that's what you're feeling right now. Like You don't even know. Just hear Paul. The worst of them. Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Paul's story is there for you and me, that there's still hope for even messed up sinners like you and me. So what else could he do with them? Praise God. Now to the king eternal, immortal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We sing, the way we sing this in our church is this lyric towards the end of one of our songs. We say, for I am not my sin and will never be again. Because there is freedom in the Lord our God. That's available for you. That is in full forgiveness of your sin, freedom from it, and life everlasting in a relationship with God is available for you. Because the power of God that brought Jesus out of the grave is directed towards you who believe. Here's the last thing I'll say, and we'll get out of here. We don't know the power of our God because we don't want to believe he works in our suffering. We don't, we don't want to suffer. This is very important to me as your pastor. God has not promised that his power will keep you from ever suffering in this world. Sometimes he does do that. Sometimes he cures the cancer. Sometimes he changes the heart of the wayward spouse or child. Sometimes he says yes to your prayer the way that you pray it. And y'all, he calls us to pray those prayers. Let's keep praying them. Prayers big enough that only God can answer. I believe that. I give my life to that. But sometimes his great power is not directed to you to alleviate you from suffering, but to instead strengthen you in your suffering. And he gets glory as you suffer for his glory. Here's the hardest thing for me. You know, I've been a pastor now for enough years. Some of you are going to get sick. You're going to stay sick until the day that you die. And it's going to be long before that should have ever happened by our measure. I hate that. I hate it. I hate that it's true. And if we believe that our death is defeat, then we will fear death and we will fear suffering. If we believe that death is the end, the great finality of all things, then we will only believe in God's power if God spares us from suffering. We will only believe God's power is real if he keeps us from suffering and from death. We want it to be well with our soul, to use the words that we sang earlier, but we think God is unfaithful when sorrows like sea billows roll. But friends, the reality in front of us is we will all suffer and we will all die. What we really need is a victory so powerful we can endure suffering with joy, can face death with courage and hope, and there to be a power that can defeat death itself. And if I believe in God's power, then I know the same thing, the Apostle Paul, the same Apostle that wrote this letter, wrote another letter, a couple of them, to a church in Corinth. And here's what he said about death. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. Very simple. Memorize it. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Yes. It's been swallowed up. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, yes. O oh my soul. Yes. Death, deserved for my sin, swallowed up in victory. So as we pray for God to cure sickness, we need to pray knowing he's already answered yes. Knowing we already have victory in Jesus over anything sickness can bring us, even death. This is God, Jonathan Evans. Um, he preached at the funeral of his mom who died of cancer and he had been wrestling with it and um, said throughout the week between the day his mom died and the funeral, he was just really struggling and God broke through, as God is so kind to often do, and reminded him that just because he didn't answer his prayer his way doesn't mean he didn't answer his prayer anyway. He said God reminded him that because of Jesus' resurrection power and because his mom believed in it, he said the way he said it was either she was going to live or she was going to live. That's the hope of our calling. 
had a family last service. Lost a um, seven-year-old son. Told me about it. And I'm like, <laughs> but that's the way they said it. We knew. They used that. He's either going to live or he's going to live. That is, that's hope. Stronger than the grave. Immeasurably, immeasurably great power towards you who believe. Do you have it? Do you experientially know the hope of your calling? Your immeasurably great worth as his inheritance. Do you know the power towards you who believe and are you walking in it? It's yours today. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for your power. That in your kindness, you've directed it towards us. Wow. I hope we don't get over it. I hope our eyes are enlightened today. Would you do what only your spirit can do? Enlighten our eyes. We need you for that, God. <laughs> that we might know, might walk out of here walking with you. You don't leave us, not even for an instant. You go with us. Would we walk in that power? And God, in your kindness, I ask for you to bear fruit. Would the power of God working in us be evident in how we live as your people bring glory to your name?